use some slides that are still in the works, but I thought might give nice context. Um, so, uh, so I guess like, can we do a little maybe like raise of hands of like, if you're like familiar with or if like worked with some spatial data um, here at Lieber or, uh, you know, either in a project or just for just for exploratory stuff. Okay, so we got uh, Ryan, we have Nick, we got a thumbs up from Nina, and then some people who are maybe a little more new. Um, but I think a lot of you have also worked with, um, uh, a lot of you have worked with uh, like summarized experiment and maybe single cell uh, or single cell experiment. And it's like going to be very similar concepts. Um, so maybe we'll just go over the background um, for a spatial real quick, um, just for anybody context. So basically how it works is that there is a frame that is full of charged spots. The spots have different primers that contain a unique barcode to each spot. Um, and then a piece of tissue, a really thin piece of tissue is applied to the spot. Um, and then there is a number like a web bench protocol that extracts the RNA. The RNA binds to these unique barcodes. And then when we build the RNA libraries, the reads contain those unique spatial barcodes and we can map all of the reads back to the spots on our fiducial frame. Um, so then we can, like, we know the expression of different genes at different locations on the cell. So we kind of have like count matrix that is by spot. So it's like, you know, higher dimensional than um, uh, like a summarized experiment, higher expression than like a bulk, bulk experiment, but it is a little bit lower, um, especially with the Visium tech than single cell because each cell contains multiple spots. Ask Nick for more details about that. Um, but um, so that's like the overarching concept. Um, so obviously we just got done our big special DLPFC project and we have a very exciting data set. And this also kind of builds off of the spatial LIBD data set. So it's all um, spatial data out of the human DLPFC. Um, so a large arm of this is spatial data, but we also have paired single nucleus RNA-seq data and Visium spatial prote proteogenomics, um, which uh, adds more imaging data to like more fine-tuned imaging fluorescence data to our um, the spatial data as well. So these are kind of like the cool data sets that we have and you can access with the spatial LIVD package. So we'll go over that in a second. Um, and then down here, this is like our summary slide from the paper, but this is like an example of like all the different exciting analysis that you maybe could want to do with this sort of data. Um, so this was just like a table of the data that is available in the, the data that's available with the fetch data function out of spatial LABD right now. Um, so we have, uh, so some ones that I'm gonna point out are we have the SCE objects, which I believe are the DLPFC or, no, okay. So this might be the spatial DLP single nucleus one. I think this one might be, was broken when I was checking out this data. But um, so we have the single cell experiment from the spatial DLPFC data set. We have the SPE layer. So the spatial data, let's see. Uh, we have this SPE object, which I believe is the original Lieber, um, like the 12 sample layered uh, single uh, spatial experiment. Um, and then I note kind of the sizes here. And then this spatial DLPFC Visium is the 30 sample Visium data set that we just worked with in spatial DLPFC. So you notice that these spatial experiments can be really big. So this is the size in gigabytes. I'm working on rounding this and making this prettier, but like the, the Visium DLPFC one is like almost seven gigabytes. Um, and I believe that a reason that it's bigger than even uh, like the single cell experiment, which we can consider big is because they have, they contain really high def images within them, which is an important part of like analyzing and understanding this data. Um, we also have the pseudobulk data, which you can see is quite a bit smaller. So that is like that data added up over some different um, clustering, Clusters. We also have the Visium SPG data, um, which is only four samples. So you can see it's uh, 0.8 gigs. Um, and then we have some other uh, uh, variations on these, but I would say that those are like the key ones. Um, we also have the modeling results. So those are like the differential expression results from the different um, data sets, um, mostly over those spatial domains. Uh, I believe that this first one is the modeling results over the annotated layers from the first experiment. So that's really useful when we're doing um, uh, like spatial registration, like I went over um, what, two weeks ago. Um, and then we also have the new uh, modeling results from the spatial DFC project. So if you wanted to do spatial registration against 
Um, the spatial domains we defined in the new project, this is the data you would use. Um, yeah, so you're able to access this with that fetch gene, like fetch data function. All you have to do is like enter um, these terms. We'll, we'll, I'll demo that in a second. Um, so yeah, uh, actually, yeah, let's go do that. Um, yeah, so I'm starting pretty much from scratch here. Um, we're going to load up the spatial LABD library. Um, so the data I'm going to actually work with today, like, is that spatial um, SPG data from the new data set. Uh, it's, like, small enough that it runs well on my laptop, but I thought it'd be exciting to look at some of the new data versus um, maybe, like, an example or the old one. So this is actually, like, our new data. So we'll use, uh, we'll say SPG, DLPSC, and we'll say fetch data, and then um, the type so if we look at the help, you can see all the different ones. Um, yeah, so this function downloads from Experiment Hub. So this is like um, a type of like uh, bioconductor package, which contains data. Um, so it has all the different types of data listed and some different um, details. Um, and they cache the data on your machine, um, which is useful because then the second time you load it, it won't take nearly as long. Sometimes they can take a little bit of time, especially those big ones to load for the first time, but then it is cached on your machine and you won't have to, it won't take nearly as long the next time you do it. So we're going to load up the proteomics data if I can find it in this list. Um, yeah, so these are all the different ones. These are all the different options for the data you can download that I just detailed in that table. So we're gonna, um, grab the SPG data. Um, and take a second to find it. Um, maybe while we're waiting for that to load, we can talk about uh, the spatial experiment object. Um, Go here. So that was my next slide. So, like an important concept to understand when you're working with this data is uh, the spatial experiment. So, this is a, like a package um, by a bunch of people, including Lucas Weber, who you might know. Um, so, basically, it's a, like um, a summarized experiment that is specific. Well, I guess it's like, I guess they have it nested. So, it's like a single cell experiment, but then again, a specialization into spatial experiment the important aspects of what it contains that like build on like single cell are um, data pertaining to the images. So it has um, in the call data, some important points. And this is an update that used to be stored in its different part, but it contains barcode in tissue, which is either true or false. In this data, you'll probably see it just be true. I believe that the false ones are filtered out. And then I'll have assay or array row and array column. So that goes back to, if, um, Kind of like how this works and these like dots are in rows and columns so this is all information that kind of like centers that data on the image and like knows what spot on that frame <clears throat> this data came from um yeah so then we also have the spatial coordinates which are like the x and y i believe in pixels um and then it has data so it, like there is specific data about like uh, <clears throat> the images stored in the object um Sorry, Luis, can you make it bigger? I don't yes, see. I can. Sorry. sorry. It's me. No? Yeah, it's small. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so it looks, it's pretty similar to like a summarized experiment. We have our row data, our call data. Um, and then like single cell, it contains like reduced dimensions because those are also very useful to look at in um, the for spatial. Um, but then kind of what's unique from single cell is that it contains this information like in tissue, array row, array column that kind of centers things on the spots, the spatial coordinates for each data and like the spots, um, and then the image data. So these two are like linked together and that's gonna help us like make those spatial plots. Um, okay, let's see how my data is doing. Okay, so it fetched the data, it accessed it from a cache that I already had on my computer, but you might see a little like loading bar if you run this on yours. Um, so let's look at what that data looks like. Um, does anybody have any questions about like the concept of the spatial experiment before we start looking at one in person? 
All right, cool. Um, yeah, so you can see this is a class spatial experiment. We can see the dimensions. So we have like 15,000 spots by 2,700 rows, which are our genes. Um, the assays that includes our counts. So this all looks very similar to like a summarized experiment. So, but then like down here, it's like spatial chords, um, pixel column in full res, pixel row in full res. So these are like, that's information that's unique to a spatial experiment. And then also this image data. So we can maybe take a look at, um, spatial chords. Um, yeah, so for each of these barcodes, um, we know where it is in the image. So we have like, we know what spot it belongs to based on these pixels. Um, so it's like the pixel column and pixel row. So that's like how we map the data back to locations in the image. Um, and then we can look at the image data as well. Interesting. Okay, so the image data can like for each of these samples, so this is like a sample in this experiment, there are different images stored in this object. Um, so we have a Luis low de... resolution image, a high resolution image, and then so those different image labels might be specific to data. Yes. Uh, the screen freeze, so and also the sound wasn't like clear. We, we cannot understand oh, no. okay. the last thing for about 20 seconds or so. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Just... Yeah, I got the little flash that my internet is on stable, so that's not ideal. Um, it seems like we're back now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good now. Okay. The and last part, issue, maybe the I last can... part, if you can okay. repeat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have another issue with that. I might have to go reset my router, but um, backing up, was I explaining the spatial chords? Is that what we missed? The position yes. of the image. Uh -huh. Position. Okay, yeah. or the image data? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The image data. yeah so the, in the spatial experiment, there's, in that object, um, there, it includes this, these images. Um, so you can kind of see the details about them. Um, there's like low res, high res detected or aligned. So these are all images that are like stored relevant to this, um, relevant to that sample. And those we can use when we plot. Um, and that's what we can see them then. Um, so yeah, so that is like an important factor and like an important detail about spatial experiment. Um, so how the image, images are stored there in the object? Um, they're contained in the object. You can access them. Um, I'm not sure of like a neat way to, I think like the easiest way to do that is like when you plot them using either like our tools like VizClus or VizGene. Um, so that's what I would say like the most straightforward way to access them. I'm sure you can like extract them from the um, object too. I'm just not sure how to do that off the top of my head or in a way that would be interesting <laughs> for us. Like oh. definitely the plotting is going to be the most interesting for us programmatically. I think you can get it in like the, I think it might be in the data column of image data and also like, I think you can use like the image raster function if I'm remembering correctly, but, but yeah, oh, okay, cool. odds are more useful than that. Yeah, probably um, like just plotting the data is gonna be like how we're probably gonna access that data um, most commonly. Um, yeah, and then I wanted to show you guys in the call data, those, those columns that are important as well. Um, yeah, so it's like for each uh, of our, rows, which is going to be a spot, right? So a spot is from one sample, and then a spot either gets an in tissue. So this object is filtered. So all of these are already true. All of that is like determined to have been in the tissue. And then um, it gets an array row and array column. So that goes back to that, like the frame and like the uh, Visium array where those spots, like the locations of all those spots. Um, yeah. Okay, so next I think like a cool way to explore this data and like really understand what's going on is like visualizing it. So we're gonna um, look at the visualization uh, just a little bit. So these are like some examples of like plots I've made using like the spatial LABD uh, visualization tools. So there's VizGene, which helps us visualize continuous variables over the spots and VizClus, which helps us visualize discrete variables over these spots. 
Um, and one thing I wanted to point out in the call data is also like some of the different columns. So I think there's a 10X clustering that happens. Um, what I'm gonna demo today is just, um, so these were also manually annotated for the histological layers in white matter. So at the bottom here, there is a, um, there's a manual annotation row and column in here somewhere. There's a lot of data in these, including um, Nick also I included like our, uh, the cell deconvolution results. So that's cool. Um, cool, so let's take a look at the visualization. Um, so yeah, the two functions that I mentioned, we'll start with this gene. Um, so basically this is a function that helps us, again, functions that helps us visualize the gene expression over our spatial, over the spots. And you have the option to either layer that over the image or not. Um, so let's see. Okay, one thing that I figured out that is easy to do for this data specifically is to just like, right now our row names are in, uh, our ensemble IDs, and it's a little easier for visualization if they are in, uh, if they're just our gene symbols. So we're gonna change that. Um, okay, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. So now if we look at our SP object, our rows are now our gene, gene symbols, which are a little easier for us to read. Um, so yeah, we're gonna do this gene. And I think I'm gonna do, um, well, let's check out what samples we have. So again, if we looked at our column data, I believe it was sample ID, but there's four samples in this data set. Um, yeah, sample ID, defined by sample ID. I think the most the prettiest one. Uh, uh, we can take a look at the breakdown. Um, so they each contain like so many spots, which we can see by doing this. Um, yeah, so here are all the different spots from our data. So you can see that it's like 3,000, it's like 3,000 to like 4,000 spots that are like in the tissue for each of these um, uh, samples. Um, so this gene, we're gonna, um, visualize one of these at a time, that's how that works. Um, so we have to define the sample ID, sample ID equals, and we're gonna say that that, I think this one, I think makes some nice visualizations, so this is 6522. Um, and I think a nice gene to visualize is NBP because it's a marker for uh, white matter. So it usually gives us some nice visualization. So let's test that out. Oh, SPE is messing with that. Oh yeah, you gotta tell it what your data actually is. Yeah, so this function makes like, so it's like, we're doing kind of a complicated thing because we're like uh, plotting the gene expression replacing those zeros. Oh yeah, wait. Um, the default is log counts. Um, but we only have counts stored in this data, which is okay. Um, you can see assay name, log counts. Oh, so I gotta change that to assay name. Okay, so that should work. Okay, so here's kind of, here's the plot we get. So it gives us, um, you can kind of see like the outline of the tissue. So this is the SPG data. So if you've seen it with like a lighter background before, um, this is because it's like this, the proteomics is happening behind this. So it's actually like a dark, uh, like uh, my, like the fluorescence microscope. So you might see some bright specks kind of on, on the edge. Um, let's see if we can zoom and okay. Yeah, so that makes the points a little bigger. So these visualizations are like pretty sensitive to what size the points are. And you're able to set that in with the vis gene function. But here we can kind of see like the tissue and where all of our spots are in their columns and rows. Um, so here's where we're going to see the highest expression of MVP, like up here and like, what is the white matter? And then also 
for this plotting, um, when it does, when it has zero counts, it gives us something different. Um, MVP is not maybe the best example of this, but like um, for, it is more sparse kind of like single cell. So like things that have zero, we wanted to differentiate. So it's set to be this like translucent gray, which does look better on a light colored background. On the black, it doesn't look so good. So let's just change it to nothing. I think that that was, um, so you can set that NA color. So basically there's a limit and then you can set anything below your limit defaults to zero, um, any color, and we can just set that to NA, and then we can get rid of the spots that aren't, that have no counts. Yeah, so you can see that there is no counts down here, which is like more gray matter, and we see that more expression. You can also like set what color scale you have. I think the vidris looks great here. Um, um, a function that we also implemented through our uh, uh, when we were like working on these gene visualizations is the auto crop. Um, so it's set to true, uh, but there's more image in there than like, so it's like around the fiducial frame is like what the default like sets to, um, but there is more image like out here. So if you turn the auto crop off, you can see like the full image. Um, so this like usually makes for like, I would say like worse plots, right? Because there's like more information that's not super relevant to us. So that's why it's set to true, but you have the option to turn this on or off. Um, you can also access different images again, like I pointed out. So it's set to the high res image. Um, so like another, like, um, I think aligned is um, uh, image ID you can set. So that's like another image that's in here. Um, as far as like the SPG, we might need Nick's help to like tell me, tell us more details about like why we have these different images for uh, these, but this one's like the black and white, and I think it's the histology. And you can see like the more details about the um, fiducial frame are like lit up in red. Um, so we can see it's like a different background because the background is like actually the image that's stored in there. Um, and then maybe we can turn the auto crop back on. So it's pretty easy to like plot different genes. Um, this is like a pretty useful function. I think it really helps everybody understand um, the uh, the spatial data pretty well. Um, you can see um, these light up. It's cropped in, so you can see the different expression. We could try a different gene like PCP4, which is a marker for our layer five. We'll see. pretty different um, uh, pattern where we see like this nice layer here. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty useful tool. Um, does anybody have any questions about this gene and like how you might um, how to use that to like visualize uh, gene expression? Any genes you wanna see on the tissue? Um, All right, cool. Um, yeah, so you can make some really beautiful images with this um, and really useful plots. All right, so we can move on to looking at this class, which is to how to do like discrete variables. So um, really relevant to us is just like uh, like clusters. Like um, so, we use like data driven clusters. We were a big part of the spatial DLP of Seek experiment, and probably will be part of future. Um, spatial experiments. So looking at those and how they relate to maybe what we expect to see in the tissue is like an important part of using the spatial data, um, you know, kind of relating the patterns of what we see back to the histological images. Um, so yeah, so we'll show this class. Um, you could probably copy actually a lot of We can look at the help for this class. Um, yeah, so the sample cluster visualization. Uh, so again, you need to take your SPE object, your sample ID, and then it's going to take your cluster variable. Um, so we don't need to give it gene ID, and there's going not going to be an NA color. Um, um, and then for this, we had manual layer label. Is part of the call data. So this was labeled by Luke Kristen on the imaging team because um, it was relevant to our 
experiment. So um, basically it's gonna take the information in there and uh, you know we can see these nice patterns um, of these clusters and we see like these nice wavy brain layers. Um, so that's cool. Um, so that's like one way you can plot uh, discrete variables. And this of course is very, very relevant to um, clustering. Um, Um, let's see, we could also like create our own clusters if we wanted to and visualize that. So let's say like we're interested in uh, maybe like the top to bottom of this. So if we like pick some row, so maybe we could like think about uh, this SPE DLPFC. Let's look at that call data again. Um, So maybe a rose. So let's let's say if I want to just split this top to bottom. C E D L P F C. Let's see. Let's. Thirty nine. Okay. So let's say let's add a row to S P E. Um, I'm not sure if this takes true or false, so let's find out together. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. So yeah, you're able to like, you could do stuff like that and like create your own clusters or like areas of interest. I don't know if you're interested in like just the top row, um, but yeah, you can divide and any, any label that you can assign to these points, you can then plot using VizClus. So that's kind of neat. Um, cool. Uh, any questions about this? Anything else anybody wants to see plotted? So, sorry, I, I think I misunderstood. I didn't understand where there's like the false and true. What does it mean? Yeah. So I was just showing an example of like a different category you could plot. So basically I was just looking at, I wanted to like say like, okay, the top of this, the top of the, the section versus the bottom of the section. So what I did was I just found the median of the array rows because um, so like the rows say this is like, um, like, I think this is one, so it's like one, two, three, four. And I think it's like 80 based on the median being like 40. So say it's like 80 different rows of spots, right? Top to bottom. And then I'm not sure what the width is, but there's like a dimension to this. Um, so basically what I said, what's the median? If it's below the median, then it's uh, top bottom. And so I just defined like another factor, just kind of like as an example. Um, but you can kind of like uh, interact with those um, spots like that. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, right, so then what did I have next on the agenda? Um, yeah, so we could do, um, and then marker finding might be something of interest. So say we wanted to find markers for the top and bottom of that, maybe that split we just created. Um, we could do that. So this is kind of an example, say that you defined your own clusters or were interested in maybe something a little more biologically real than top and bottom, but um, we could do that as well. So um, during uh, the spatial registration, I went over the, um, actually, let's, yeah, let's go look at the function reference. Um, We're gonna go look at the references from spatial LABD. Um, so of course, like there's a lot of information about like all the different functions here. And then like, here's like the reference list, but we're gonna look at this class of functions, which are these registration um, functions. So these help you find marker genes and then which are important for the spatial registration process. So 
Uh, registration wrapper is going to be like the easiest way to do this. Um, but if you wanted to like preserve the, um, if you wanted to like observe the data as you go, you can like perform the different steps. Um, I think we have the time to do that. So we can do that here. Um, so yeah, we're gonna find some marker genes for top and bottom, which might, I'm not sure how that's gonna look, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, it might not work great because I think that the arrangement of these different, um, We'll find out, but like the arrangement of the different uh, uh, SC, uh, SPE objects, like maybe we'll try a different function here. Like I think that they're, the white matter is in different areas, which if I was gonna guess is gonna be like what is going to um, pull up the most here, right? Cause here's our, our white matter is gonna be in the top. Let's look at one other. Um, where's our table of sample IDs? Um, let's look at this sample. Okay, so here our white matter is also looks like at the top, but this is brown one. Um, and then let's try our, this other sample, let's see where our top bottom ends up. Yeah, so our white matter is gonna end up in our top um, group, but that's okay. Well, um, so that, that might actually give us some stronger markers. So let's, let's, let's find out. Um, so we can use registration wrapper, which is like, maybe the easiest way to do this. Um, I guess, would you guys be interested in seeing the whole process or you can just use registration wrapper? Um, I think it maybe let's actually, I'll show the steps of the process. We don't have to go over them in super details. Um, so the first step that's important is we're gonna use a pseudobulk. Um, so, um, is everybody familiar with pseudobulking? I think we've gone over it a couple times in some different examples. Um, again, it's just like, say for each of our classes, um, we're gonna like sum over the clusters. So like for a sample for top and bottom, we're gonna sum all the counts for tops for each gene and all the bottoms. So instead of having 15 or like 2000 columns for a sample, now we have two. So it's gonna make our data much more condensed. Um, that's gonna help remove some of the sparsity, which is why it's important for marker binding. Um, so we're gonna use this registration pseudobulk uh, function. So it takes our SCE object. Um, so I guess when I was playing with this, I was using manual layer, layer label, um, but we're actually gonna use this row top bottom. Um, that's our new registration variable. So this is like the registration, var registration is like, the variable we're interested in testing over. Often that's gonna be like cluster. So here, row, top, bottom. So like layer would might've been something. Um, any of those base space clusters is what we ran for spatial DLPFC. Um, you give it your sample ID because it's gonna test over sample. And then covariates that are important for a differential expression ex experiment. So age and sex are common ones. Um, uh, yeah, basically like variables that you might use for a differential expression. Designing your model is kind of like a whole other R session, so we won't get into that too much now, but these are like variables that are important to preserve. That's why we're giving it to the registration suitable. Um, so. so why do, uh, sorry, one question. Why do we do pseudobulk for re registration? Um, so we want a pseudobulk. Often we're using um, like single nucleus or spatial registration. So. That data is pretty sparse. So when you pseudobulk, it helps like eliminate the sparsity and makes like the, the signal more clear. Um, Thank you. It also way reduces the computational burden because these get really big really fast. Um, so again, we've taken, so if we look at our SPE pseudobulk, um, the dimensions are now eight because we have four samples, two categories. So we're down to only eight. Um, like eight columns. Um, yeah, so basically what the pseudobulk does is it's gonna, we can look at the call data. Um, um, it's a lot of this is gonna be NAs. Basically it preserves all the data it can. So across like a sample, 
And yeah, so if you look at the columns, it adds that uniqueness. So this is like top false. This is a sample ID and tissue is like all the same for that. So it preserves that. And then it's gonna preserve things like our um, phenotype data, like age and sex, because those were unique. Um, however, all these other in interesting information about like, uh, so like this um, cell deconvolution data Nick had in here, um, different metrics for each spot are gonna just turn to NAs because they were unique over that class. So we lose a lot of that data, but it's gonna preserve all the data it can. And then it also adds this um, uh, column and cells here. That's not super accurate. It should be end spots, but the function doesn't know that we, we're working with Visium data, not um, like single cell data. So it tells you like how many um, here in this case spots were summed to create this data. Um, we can also look at the head of count. Wait, I hope this works. Counts for SP. To the bulk. And basically, yeah, so it has eight columns. So these are like the summed counts um, for this. Um, the pseudobulk registration also is going to have the normalized log counts uh, in here as well, because it normalizes as it sums based on like the, the new library sizes, like the, the library sizes we've created when we sum over those columns. So that's like important. So that's what we're going to run the test on. Um, there's some other steps, um, such as like, uh, we have to build a model, find the, yeah, we, we can run that. So um, the next step is we're gonna build the model. Um, so there's another wrapper function called registration model. Oh. Um, so this function defines a statistical model. So basically it's gonna do this based on like the variables in our pseudobulk. Um, Um, so it's going to take our S, our suitable SPE. Um, it's going to take our covariates, which were age and sex. Um, and the very the variable registration is actually already in our call data. Suitable registration is going to. We, we told it that. So these functions all are designed to work together and make sure that like your column names are like consistent. So this is gonna be like the variable we're testing for. So in this case, it is top to bottom, right? Um, so that's all we need to give. Mod um, is gonna quickly create a model. Um, we can look at the head of it. Um, um, yeah, so it's gonna, you know, registration variable false and true. So it has like those uh, variables spelled out and then it has age and sex as well. Um, and then we can, we got to compute the block correlation because this relies on uh, these registration like differential expression functions are powered by like Lima. So we need to um, calculate the block force to make sure that none of our um, variables are like too correlated. Um, they shouldn't be. Um, Um, and this takes our SCE um, pseudobulk and it takes our model and then the sample ID and um, should already be baked in to our, um, should are baked into the, the data already. This takes a second, this takes way longer if you're using big data. This is often something you're going to have to run on um, a cluster. Um, and that's a big reason why we provided this data available for both download and you can also access it on the websites. But if you have a fresh uh, like spatial experiment object, you might want to run it, you, you know, you will have to run it yourself. Um, so finally, we're at the point where we can calculate this enrichment model. Um, so we're testing like this is like a one versus all. In our case, where we have two clusters one versus all other clusters is going to be one ver like true versus false. So that's okay, we can still, we'll, we'll run it anyway, but um, if you, it would maybe be more relevant to, um, if you had three clusters, um, so registration stats enrichment, and this is going to take our SPE pseudobulk, it's going to take our block correlation, block core, 
We're just going to take our covariates. If I can type. Um, I forget this needs anymore. Let's look at the help real quick. And then VAR registration, VAR sample ID are already in there. Um, one thing that can be helpful is telling it what your gene ensemble and gene name uh, rows are, because that helps assign that to, um, I believe this was gene ID. Let's look at the row data. Um, so this is helpful because then it like has everything formatted nicely in your output. Um, yeah, so gene ID is our gene ensemble, and then gene name is gene name. So we'll, we'll give it all those variables. This is getting long. Okay. So that ran really fast. Um, once again, we're doing this on like a very uh, a small data set with like a pretty simplified clustering structure. Be warned that this can take quite a bit of time and computing power if you're going to do this for real. Um, but yeah, cool. So we've got some output. Let's explore that output. Um, again, you can do this whole process using the registration wrapper. It is also going to run the ANOVA and pairwise models. So ANOVA being like just testing that there's any differences between the groups and pairwise testing like, um, for instance, layers, it'll test like layer one versus layer two. Um, so, and like then layer one versus layer three and so on. Um, so let's take a look at what this enrichment um, data looks like. Um, so it's a big long table. Probably should have looked at the head, just the head. Um, okay, so what it's going to do is the t-statistic for false, so our false group, which I believe was bottom. Um, this is the t-statistic um, for the differential expression. And then we have a p-value for false. We have an FDR for false, and then the log fold change. So we're able to see like all these statistics from like a differential expression analysis for our two groups. Um, so something that might be interesting is like, ooh, let's plot like the most differentially expressed gene for the top. Um, so we might want to um, yeah, so we're gonna just let's order. Enrichment by uh, FDR for true. And then we want decreasing equals false. Um, yeah, so let's try that. Okay, so we have our um, FDR for true is the lowest. So we actually didn't get any significant genes, which might be because that's not actually like a meaningful split in this data. Um, but we can still take a look at what, so it's MRXA. So let's go copy our um, this gene data from up here. Okay, so it looks like we got one really strong expressing expression right there uh, in the top when like, you know, these other two and none in the bottom. So, um, you know, this might work better if you actually like have a more thoughtful analysis of the data um, than top and bottom. Let's see if we can get anything that's less sparse. So yeah, so this looks like it's picking up on uh, white matter again, uh, VWA1. Um, so yeah, definitely looks different between the top and bottom if we zoom in. Uh, so I would say it, like it does look, I mean, it's not significantly differentially expressed, but you know, we are seeing some signal. 
Um, yeah, so that's kind of how you can do that. Um, you can also plot your pseudoblock data, so that can be kind of interesting. Um, there's functions to it. It needs like a very specific output, which doesn't work with local data. So I might work with Leo on making that work. Um, but an easy way we can look at that just in the pseudoblock data is using the function from scatter. Um, and we're going to use, um, so that's plot expression. Um, so we're going to use our SPE pseudobulk, and we're going to look at, let's maybe look at those two genes that we just um, thought about. So we liked, um, let's look at these first three genes. Um, and then the other thing it wants is X. So we're going to give it tap. Uh, what do we call that? Row top bottom. Okay. Um, this is going to give us row top bottom so we can see. Um, interesting. That's not how I thought that was going to look. Um, oh, probably because, oh, okay, so CFA74. Oh, okay, so actually some of these T statistics are true. So you have to be like uh, careful about like looking at where the T statistics is, T statistics, and it's actually like, enriched or uh, depleted. So um, we actually have some negative T statistics. So I misinterpreted that. Um, so you can see that they're actually, it's actually lower in true than MXRA. Again, when we looked at the visualization of that gene, we're looking at, we're, this is, the test was considering all four samples and we only visualized the one. So I guess here, word of war warning, you know, uh, you know, be careful, like be thorough when you're analyzed, thorough and, um, pay attention when you're analyzing your data to your statistics. But for VWA1, we can see that this is like more highly expressed in our true for like these three samples. Um, again, the statistics were not very strong. So we're seeing pretty similar expression. So I would say that like it's true, top and bottom is not an important factor when you're considering this data set. So like that's at least what we learned here. Um, but yeah, that's how you can use some of our tools to do the steps, again, you can use these T stats out of here to do spatial registration on um, the same way that I did last time. So if you wanted to see like what those registered to, my guess would be it'd be like not something very interesting out of the, our layers, you could do that. Um, yeah, so that's how those like kind of dovetail. So um, any questions, anything that we'd wanna dive more deep into? We have five more minutes, cool. Well, if no one has any more questions, we can call it there and uh, everybody can enjoy their Friday, so.